The red wave crashes miles from shore. Are Republicans now drowning in their own bile? Hi, everybody. It's Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz. Our election postmortem panel includes Daniel Hahn, health reporter for Politico NJ, Joanna Gagas, senior correspondent for NJ Spotlight News, and Terrence McDonald, editor of New Jersey Monitor. We'll hear from the panel in just a few minutes, but we begin today with maybe the one Republican who was smiling on election night this week. Yeah, he won his election handily, but he was also the Republican with a different kind of message. Senator John Bramnick joins us now. Senator, welcome back to Roundtable. Good to be with you, Dave. So your party took it on the chin bad this week, losing assembly seats and failing on what was really a key election night for them. What happened? Well, you can't be crazy as a Republican. You can't deny legitimate elections. You can't ignore January 6th. You have to be reasonable. You have to make sense. And in my district, which is a Democratic district, I won by 10 points. And here's why. I'm nothing special. But they don't love Joe Biden. They don't love Phil Murphy but they're worried about the Republicans. They don't trust us. What happened in Summit in Westfield, we put up trustworthy candidates who weren't crazy, who weren't election deniers, who weren't uh, spewing hate at the other side, weren't using sound bites uh, where you're mad at the, hate the Democrats. We sounded like normal people. And guess what? That's all that voters want, some normalcy in the Republican party. So if you want to just hate Democrats and you want to spew hate, you're going to lose. I don't care about vote by mail. That's just an excuse. Uh, what the concern is, is the image and brand of the Republican Party. And if we don't change it, we'll always be in the minority. So what's the message? All right. Don't talk about Trump and stop yelling at people. But what else does your party have to do to regain the trust? Well, everybody knows we're a fiscally conservative party. What they don't know is whether or not we're going to do crazy stuff the way Trump did. What they don't kind of trust crazy Trump. stuff? Like what? Well, what does he do? First of all, he comes across and yells at people. He says he's going to suspend the Constitution, right? He says the election wasn't real. Uh, he says, well, January 6th was nothing, and he didn't stop January 6th. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. And that is the image of the Republican Party in New Jersey. And in New so, Jersey, if that's the image, we lose. So has the has your party been hijacked? This used to be the party of, of, of Tom Kane Sr. That's exactly right. It used to be the party of Tom Kane Sr. So who hijacked it? Who hijacked who it? Who hijacked it? There's an image because our leader is still, and I don't like him, Donald Trump. So people go in, swing voters go in, they go like this, you know, I'm not crazy about that Democrat in that district, but you know something? I don't trust the Republican. He's, and look what happened in Washington. We couldn't find a speaker, and then we find a speaker who's an election denier. <laughs> you think that helps us win swing districts in New Jersey when you have, le when, when a fellow like Jordan gets a lot of votes down there? Come on. I mean, so that, that's the image of the Republican Party. We got to change it. So who in New Jersey, I mean, do I, I see Republicans posting online that there need to be there needs to be consequences to this big loss this week. Should there be some changes made at the state Republican committee? Act like Vince Palestina. Vince Palestina won Atlantic City. That's a swing district, right? He did it because he's not crazy, doesn't act crazy. People trust them. I won District 21. We have candidates who can win, and they can win statewide. So, but but, the, but does the Republican Party in the state need some changing? Is there someone uh, who should replace the current leadership who is more receptive to the message that you're uh, putting out there? First of all, the Republican Party is not one entity. Yeah, it is a combination of many 
different districts. And in some districts, Trump plays well. I don't criticize those people. But statewide and swing districts want Republicans that are fair-minded, not spewing hate, uh, not hating Democrats. Yep, I get all of that. their job I, and I get all results. Of those. I get all of that. But, but there, there's a, a, a committee... Uh, a Republican state committee that drove this message. They drove it to most of the districts uh, and that leadership of, of the party. Some are saying that there needs to be changes there. This is kind of a, a yes or no question, Senator. Do there need to be changes at the state uh, party committee? I don't think they dictate what we say in each election. I don't think they set the agenda. Each senator or assembly person sets the agenda. They may get a suggestion from somebody, but the bottom line is we decide as individual senators how to sell our brand. And I'm going to tell you, our brand has to change. If that means uh, leadership wants to follow my lead in terms of a reasonable approach, you know, I can't stand this sound bite type thing that Republicans are mad at the Democrats. We hate the Democrats. They don't care about that. They want to know who you are. Are you authentic? Are you going to respect the court decisions? Are you going to respect, uh, respect the institutions uh, in our country, like the FBI and, uh, and the courts? Or are you going to just sit back and criticize everything and then people won't trust you? I'm going to, I'm in plan A. Plan A is authenticity, anti-Trump, pro-voter, pro-citizen. Okay, so here you are, 70-year-old. You look great, by the way. Uh, uh, we we hear every four years, oh, Bramnick's going to run for governor. Here we are again, another uh, cycle. Uh, is Bramnick going to run for governor finally? I mean, time Bramnick, is of the essence here, no? Bramnick is going to tell you very soon, okay, but this time I have a four-year term as a senator. In the past, I had a two-year term. I, I could run this year and lose a primary or lose a general election, and guess what? I'll still be around selling the same message of civility, honesty, fairness, and not not spewing hate around the state. So you look forward the next couple of months to my potential announcement. How's that? Well, that's insufficient for our purposes, Senator, but I, I understand what you're saying. Um, you say you're going to take your message across the state. Um, you're from District, what is it, 21, right? District That's 20? right. Yeah. So you're going to go beyond District 21. You're going to go way down south to uh, uh, what used to be Ed Durr country is now John Bersicelli country um, to all the way up to the Parker Space uh, parts of the state saying what? Make me governor and I'll bring civility back to my party? No, I'm going to say first you have to win to stop the Democrats from moving far to the left. If you don't win... You can't change anything. So who is the most electable person statewide? And if we get to that point where I make the announcement, I would make the announcement that we need somebody who's electable, not somebody who's just throwing red meat to Republicans around the state, and then they lose. We lose, we lose, we lose. So bottom line is, do you want to win or not? That's my message. All right. So th this um, statewide tour, uh, it's not officially a tour, I guess, but you say you're taking your message statewide, is does your decision to run for governor come from what you hear on that statewide tour? No, it's going to come from me and how uh, important it is for me to get this message out across the state to Republicans. Whatever I find out there is not going to be the ultimate decision maker. It's going to be coming from inside of me how important it is for me to get this message out about where the Republican Party should be, what our brand should be, and convince people to trust us. That's going to motivate me. All right, John Bramnick, state senator, maybe potential gubernatorial candidate. Good to see you again, man. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, David. All right, panel, Joanna, Terrence, Dan, uh, welcome to you all. Let's get some reacts, takeaways, observations uh, from Tuesday's elections. Terrence? Well, <laughs> I think one of the main takeaways is Republicans need to convince their voters to start using mail-in ballots. 
because Democrats are just absolutely destroying them before polls even open. And they're just, they're not, they're not going to win in some of these competitive districts unless they get some of their voters to do that. And we talked to the guy who used to run the GOP very recently, and he's not a Bramnick type. He's not a, a moderate, let's play nice with Democrats type, but he said, Democrats have found a way by using mail-in ballots of getting low propensity voters to vote. They're not cannibalizing their election day vote. They're just increasing the number of people who are voting and Republicans just aren't because a lot of their voters think that mail-in votes are a scam. Dan, uh, your, your uh, observations from Tuesday? Uh, largely agree with Terrence on the vote by mail. We know that uh, New Jersey is generally bluer when it comes to federal elections. And what the Democrats have been able to do is that they're able to get those voters who come out for Democrats in federal elections, but they're starting to get them to come out um, in these off-year elections with the vote by mails. Uh, just another general observation, good night for uh, South Jersey Democrats. They held the fourth, which was viewed as a very competitive district, um, became a lot more red during redistricting, and uh, they were able to uh, get back the third legislative district uh, from Ed the Trucker and Company. Um, and just an observation from that race, it looks like that Senator Ed Durr, who uh, became something of a national celebrity briefly for ousting uh, mm -hmm. Senate, then Senate President Steve Sweeney, he was really a drag on the ticket because if you look at the election results, uh, his assembly running mates had a much closer race uh, than he did. And I think that's in part because uh, the Democrats really hit Durr on uh, some of his distasteful prior comments on uh, on abortion and uh, on women in general, quite frankly, and that uh, really, really hurt him uh, yeah. on Tuesday. Live by the trucker, die by the trucker. Joanna, what was uh, some of your takeaway? Well, I think playing off of what we just heard from Senator Bramnick, really Republicans tried to drive home these culture war issues that they hoped and they thought were going to turn out their base. And I was down in the 16th with Senator Gopal, excuse me, in the 11th with Gopal. And uh, that felt really flat for Republicans. They did not get out the support that they thought they would on issues like the transgender policies in schools, where we saw that playing out um, in, in those school districts in the 11th in particular. And it just didn't turn out the Republican base the way that they thought. And, and frankly, I think that the abortion issue uh, Dem Republicans thought would not be something that turned out Democrats. It's already state law here, but it looks like that is still an issue that is motivating Democratic voters. So um, the culture wars did not play out the way Republicans hoped and, and probably did benefit, benefit Democrats. Uh, Terrence, Steve Sweeney is dying to tell people that he's running for governor. <laughs> sure. Is there a question? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I just wanted you to... I just wanted that chuckle out of you as an answer. <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, he and uh, probably 100 other Democrats are running for governor. How about Vin Gopal? Oh, yeah, huge, huge. No. He won by a way larger margin than he did the last time. These attacks, like we just talked about, just weren't working on him yeah. or, or on a lot of other Democrats. I, he's just a popular guy. He's just people. I, it looks like voters just see him as a reasonable person, and uh, the results reflected that. You have to give Gopal credit for the effort that went behind this win. He said that he won by only a couple hundred votes uh, in 2021 while his assembly running mates lost. And he pounded the pavement. He said he was on the phones all day, uh, the day before the election, the day of the election, trying to turn out the vote. And in the end, he got 50 percent more of the Asian population in his district to turn out. So you got to give him credit for, for the effort that went behind getting people out to the votes because he had a 60 percent margin win at the end. Dan, what did he you also hear massively, from massively, massively outspent his opponents? It was like seven to one or something. Say that again. I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. He massively over uh, like uh, outspent his opponents. It was something like seven to one, I think. And again, a, a great example there of of just um, vote by mail, early voting. How much that really? You didn't even have to motivate. You were just kind of putting the ballots in people's hands. No, Dan. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, as as Terrence stated before, this was an election where you really saw. Um, uh, Democrats really use vote by mail to their advantage. Although I think that in the case of the 11th, 11th, 11th legislative district, 
Um, Gopal has shown that he's definitely a strong politician. He has coattails. Um, his assembly running mates, his Democratic assembly running mates, also won by pretty convincing margins, mm. uh, ousting Republicans who were viewed as uh, as moderates and who had won in 2021 by just a couple hundred votes. Uh, I think in the 11th, vote by mail was definitely part of the winning equation, but that that wasn't uh, the sole determining factor. When you win by 20 points, there's there's a lot of things that go into that. Yeah, he as he told us several times that night, he's the first Monmouth County Democrat to uh, win a third term. So there's that. Uh, aftermath now, uh, Senator Scutari and Speaker Coughlin back in their leadership roles. Daniel, there's a whole lame duck session ahead, no? Uh, sometimes things of consequence happen there. You covered the Scutari Coughlin uh, presser. I imagine the lame duck session came up. Uh, it did. It did come up. Um, but what, that, what did not come up is uh, anything that they would firmly commit to posting. Uh, a lot of reporters asked them, what's your lame duck agenda? Will you commit to posting um, bills on, on these topics? And they said that a lot of things were up for consideration. Um, the one thing I would note is that Coughlin said that uh, expect more affordability messaging. Um, and that's something that you saw come from the 2021 elections where uh, Democrats thought that they were uh, need to focus more on affordability after losing so many seats. But as to what we should expect to see in the lame duck session, uh, Governor Murphy has been very adamant that his liquor license reform proposal go through. Um, and you've seen some public comments from uh, Democrats in the state Senate that they're not too thrilled about the liquor license overhaul, uh, but that's a very big priority of the governor's and he has that is what he has said publicly he wants to see that get done. Um, <clears throat> Senator President Secretary has told uh, other senators that he will post uh, the casino smoking ban bill during the lame session, so that could come up. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing that people are looking out for is reform to uh, the Open Public Records Act, how the public gets access to government records. That's something that uh, Speaker Coughlin, Senator Scuteri have wanted to get done for a while. And now we've actually seen legislation come up in this space. Uh, will it come up during lame duck? Up, you queued up my soundbite uh, for me, Dan. Uh, someone did ask about that yesterday. Let's get, uh, uh, I think it's Coughlin talking about it right now. The truth is we are looking to modernize and, and preserve people's right to the documents. But I firmly believe uh, that people have the right to access to government records unequivocally. But uh, using the, misusing that process for other aims, as the Senate president so clearly pointed out, is, 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 a, is a detriment to the effective, efficient, and uh, affordability of government. Terrence, is that so? <laughs> No, I, 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 you know, I don't know what they talk about when they talk about misuse. Sometimes yeah. they talk about commercial entities who use Oprah to get documents, but that isn't necessarily misuse. You know, we just had a New Jersey Supreme Court decision not too long ago that said, you know, Jersey City was fighting a, a guy who sold invisible um, fences because he wanted dog license information. Well, there's a legitimate public interest in that because you know, if I live in a town, I want people who have potentially dangerous dogs to have an invisible fence or a fence. So there is a public argument to be made for some commercial entities having the right to documents just like I or you would. Yeah, that's that's what I assume they mean by misuse. I don't think it's misuse, but they're the lawmakers. So uh, <laughs> uh, wild guest time. OK, uh, one word answers here. Uh, will he or won't he Bramnick run for governor? Joanna? I'm saying yes. Dan? Yep. <laughs> yep. Terrence? <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, here's one more. What will Phil Murphy wear to Tammy Wer uh, Murphy's Senate announcement? Terrence? I don't know. Hopefully he's sober. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, Daniel. Uh, I'll definitely bet on a pair of all birds. Oh, <laughs> that's an easy one. All right, Joanna. I was going to say a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> 
I guess, you know, that's that's kind of the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Uh, all week we've we've been talking about it. The the uh, governor's um, happy uh, tone on election night brought on by probably a few belts before or during the party. I thought it was charming, frankly, to see a uh, an elected official who, despite having had a glass of wine or two, uh, held his own and actually kind of made sense. I mean, Joanna, you were there. Uh, he, despite his, his sometimes slurred speech, he made sense. He wasn't like talking out the side of his neck. No, he wasn't. Listen, you know, a, a couple questions in, I think Sophie Munoz and I realized that the governor had a drink or two, but um, he was able to, to communicate and, and, you know, graciously gave us an interview in the middle of greeting all of his, you know, his supporters there. Um, yeah, look, if Democrats had had a tougher night, you can you could probably bet that the governor would not have had that glass of wine or two. Um, he, it was pretty clear early on that they had cause to celebrate and, and he did. I don't know if I'd call it charming, but you know, entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I love this guy. I love this guy. I love this guy. Uh, Terrence, here's one for you. It's a freebie. Uh, McGreevy's run for Jersey City Mayor. Love it? Uh, I, I don't love it or hate it, but I think what I think is going to be interesting is he's leaning into the fact that he resigned because of a sex scandal, right? Because he had an affair with a man yeah. in 2004. He's not leaning into the fact that that guy was someone he hired, put on the state payroll for six figures as his Homeland Security advisor. And I know he told you that's not what he did, but he definitely did do that because I've read like a thousand articles from that time yeah. where he was interviewed talking about the security smarts of this guy that was his secret boyfriend. So I'm sort of curious how much that part of the scandal is going to make an appearance on the campaign trail in Jersey City. Yeah, it's a good point. All right. Time for our only in Jersey moments, headlines and notes that are quintessentially Jersey. Terrence, you got one. Yes. So mine is involves Senator Joe Lagana. He's a Democratic state senator up in Bergen County that just won re-election. A couple months ago, his campaign team put out an ad where they were making Sunday sauce for their family and they're all making sauce. And he talked about how you have to work together. Um, and it ended with him putting this gigantic 40 pound bowl of spaghetti on the table. And on election night in his victory speech, he said, uh, if anybody wants to know, the cost of making spaghetti and putting it on the table is $2 million. So only in Jersey does uh, does a spaghetti dinner cost $2 million. It was a 40-pound bowl after all. Joanna, you got one? I mean, I you know, only in Jersey do you go to interview the governor and he's got a little buzz. Uh, but I would say there's another one, which is only in Jersey does a union boss try to muscle up on a reporter and subtly threaten you to tell a good story about his candidate and then check in on you later on in the night, make sure you did what he asked you to do. So <laughs> uh, don't think for for a second that that sways said reporter. He, he picked the wrong reporter, I think. Uh, mine comes from South Jersey, where Republicans took a beating this week. I hope you will allow me a moment to pile on. Uh, while we know election night victory parties are still evolving post-COVID, it is a tradition for the losers to concede in public before the volunteers and others who backed them. You didn't see much of that this year. It's also a Jersey tradition for candidates to face the press so that voters who aren't already in their corner can learn more about what they're about. The GOP, by and large, tried to sidestep that responsibility this election, and I hope they realize that it cost them. Guess what? Even if you think voters hate us, most still recognize the importance of journalists and journalism to the process. The party of Tom Kane Sr. understood that. Apparently, the party of Tom Kane Jr. does not. Lastly, astute viewers of Roundtable will note that we had Mayor Steve Phillips scheduled for our election night edition. The mayor had to cancel because his wife went into labor. Turns out that was a false alarm. But two days later, this charming young child arrived. Her name is Sage Montana Phillip. The family is doing fine. And the mayor is off the hook for stiffing us on Tuesday. And that's Roundtable for this week. Terrence, Joanna, Dan, always good to see you guys. Thank you. Thanks also to John Bramnick for joining us. You can follow us on X at Roundtable NJ and get extra content, 
including full episodes when you scan the QR code on the screen. I'm David Cruz. For all the crew here at Gateway Center in downtown Newark, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954. And by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com. 